curious kind of locust pirouetting in the streets of Port of Spain, Trinidad at carnival time, proves that insects have a certain significance in that part of the world. The butterflies are as much a part of local mythology as this dragon. But what is the nature of the real insects in Trinidad that have prompted this mythology? The island has been cut off from the mainland of South America long enough for some of its wildlife to be different, but its insects are mostly the same. In the mountains of the northern range, above the famous Trinidad Pitch Lake, this research team found a fascinating confrontation between two particular insect species. Each member of this party is an expert in one particular group of animals. David Thompson follows his father Gerald's interest in insects. Gerald Thompson already knows the island, so he can show the other members what to look out for. On this trip, the scientific team studied two different types of ants. Like the biblical brothers Cain and Abel, one group are hunters and the other farmers. Both live together in the high forests of the northern range, where their lives overlap. The scene of the conflict is the shady forest floor among the leaf litter. The hunters are the army ants. They're nomads, wanderers, but from time to time they have to make a base for a few weeks. The ants pour down the tree each morning to go hunting in an apparently chaotic horde spilling across the forest floor but they're actually quite methodical in their behavior. This is one reason why they're held in awe, even feared in the tropics. The marching column of hunters is kept together by scent left by the leaders and reinforced by every other ant that passes that way. A narrow column of pioneers pushes out far from the base camp, searching for food. Army ants share out tasks according to their size. The biggest are the soldiers, which often stand still by the trail, as if they were directing operations. When the column comes to an awkward place, the first workers to arrive form a bridge, linking together and standing still while the others walk over them. sweep through the wood, nothing that moves is safe. The column spreads out into a broad fan shape and the forest goes quiet, except for the call of ant birds, which follow the marauders to snatch up any insects they flush out of hiding. Cockroaches on the forest floor have no defense. Their only chance is to bury themselves before the ants arrive. A spider that could kill single ants with ease is completely overrun by an army of them and eventually dismembered and taken back to the camp limb by limb. Another cockroach burrows for cover only to be trapped and held by a mob of ants. The ants wave their antennae incessantly sampling the ant scent in the air. This may be how they coordinate their activities, by sensing the mood and perhaps even the intentions of the ants around them. Stick insects are almost never attacked. This is partly because they taste bad to the ants and partly because they stand motionless. The army makes a bivouac, a temporary encampment in a sheltered place. The walls of the bivouac are made up of the ants themselves, hanging in strands to form a living curtain round the queen. These temporary camps are the nearest thing the army ants have to a home. They stay for three weeks, 
just long enough to rear a new generation of workers, 40,000 of them. Some of the senior workers form the walls of the bivouac. Hooks on their hind legs interlock with their neighbours. They remain on duty for days at a time. Their food is brought to them by other workers. Somewhere within this living fortress is the queen, laying eggs under the care of the rest of the workers. As the larvae hatch, hunting parties go out more often to find them food. Army ants can sting like wasps as well as bite, and it will be a foolish person who tried to move them to see the queen. Disturbed by something, they start to move the bivouac, providing a glimpse of the inside of the stronghold. The whitish objects are the growing larvae. Moving camp while the queen is laying is strictly an emergency measure. But the army ants organization rises to the occasion and soon an orderly procession sets off into the night carrying young grubs and cocoons to find a new temporary home. The key to the well-being of all social insects like the ants is their queen. While the army ant queen is laying, her abdomen is grossly swollen with eggs and in many instances she can't walk. But her workers have things under control. Suddenly, a tight knot of workers appear by the base of the old campsite. Presiding over the cluster are two or three large soldier ants. And in the centre, the queen herself, bloated and still laying eggs, but already on her way out of the nest. The workers round her gather up the eggs she lays and join the column to march to their new quarters. Not an egg is lost. The individuals in ant society may be anonymous, but each one is a precious part of the whole. The queen's head and thorax are dwarfed by her huge hind end. She lives for five years or more, and during that time she'll lay over two million eggs. With occasional pauses for egg laying, the queen proceeds laboriously on her way. And once she started laying eggs, nothing can stop her. The rest of the army marches on through the night in search of its new home, carrying the next generation, grubs and pupae. There are always a few unladen ants doubling back on the trail to reinforce the scent for those following behind. Some others, which aren't carrying anything, bridge the way over a fallen twig. Finally, by chemical trailblazing, the scouts lead the army to its new quarters, a hole in a mahogany tree. It's already occupied by wasps, but that doesn't stop the ants, and they soon vacate. vicious stings, the wasps are no match for a troop of army ants. The entrance is crowded as they carry their precious burdens into the hole. Clearing out wasps' nests is nothing new to army ants. Even species of wasps which create their nests in more man-made surroundings can fall prey to the ants' relentless invasion. The location of the wasps' nest made using the nearby door almost impossible without getting stung. In a few hours, the army ants had solved that problem. They simply moved in 
and carried off eggs and grubs and even the adult wasps. Some people who live in the tropics welcome a visit from the army ants to clear their houses of vermin. But it's important that people keep out of the way while it's going on and take their pets with them. The ants will attack every living thing. Outside in the forest, there's evidence that the second species, leafcutter ants, have been at work. In certain areas, the trees and shrubs have been reduced to bare skeletons. The leaf cutters are just as efficient as the army ants and as thorough too. They strip vegetation in the same way as locusts do, but for an unexpected purpose. Leaf cutter ants are a serious pest of orange and lemon groves in South America. They cripple the trees by removing their foliage, which reduces the crop. When Trinidadian farmers began planting citrus trees, the ants soon moved in and their telltale mounds began to appear. Now they're well established. Their trails crisscross the forest floor, each worker bringing home one more contribution to the communal garden. David Thompson followed a trail back to the harvesting site, a shrub 45 meters from the nest. The ants work patiently to cut out a D-shaped bite from the leaf. Their jaws are curved, rather like a tailor's shears, making them perfectly adapted for this specialized activity. They're very methodical. A working party attacks one leaf at a time, cutting it up and carrying it away until it's all gone, before moving on to another on the same spray. Each piece is carefully manoeuvred into the carrying position before it's taken to the ground. The size of the pieces of leaf seems to be fairly constant, about the span of an ant's legs. Sometimes, they're more ambitious. The leaf cutters set off at once for the nest when they've completed their cut. On many of the homeward bound leaves, there are passengers. Some leaf cutter ants are minute. They travel out with the harvesters and then ride back on the cut leaves. Why they do it is simply not known. Recent research into these diminutive hitchhikers suggests that they're necessary to ward off parasitic flies that would otherwise attack the leaf carriers. Whatever their function, no harvesting party sets off without them. Beside the trail, there are always some soldiers guarding the workers as they pass to and fro. Generations have beaten down the leaf litter on this miniature highway.
The entrance to the nest is a mere crack in the ground. A cat-eyed night snake rests above the ants as they trudge back and forth with their burdens throughout the night. It's not only leaves that they collect. Once they've started work on a shrub or the branch of a tree, they strip it completely of flowers and seeds and even the leaf stems. Ecologists refer to the energy flow of a forest, meaning the way in which fallen leaves rot into the ground and eventually get used again by other plants. The ants play their part in this process. The leaves and flowers do more than just rot underground. They form a compost on which the ants grow their food, a special kind of fungus. When the leaves are first brought in, the workers lick them. Their saliva speeds up the process of decay. On this carefully prepared bed, the pale threads of the fungus grow. The tiny workers, whose function in the harvest is so mysterious, have a definite job here. They weed the beds by eating the spores of any unwanted fungi that get brought in by accident. In the kitchen garden live the larvae, surrounded by their food and tended by other worker ants. The whole colony is the offspring of one enormous queen who lives deep inside the mound, tended by her workers and guarded by soldiers. She looks markedly different to an army ant queen. The fungus has never been found growing above ground, or indeed anywhere else but in these ant nests. The leafcutters' colonies can grow to an enormous size, as much as 45 metres across. Each new nest is provided with a tiny piece of fungus to start it off, carried by the queen from the nest where she grew up. This system evolved and was perfected over millions of years. The leafcutters are tireless in their efforts. farming leafcutter ants are the army ants, the hunters of the forest floor. If in the course of one of their hunting expeditions they find a leafcutter nest, the result is war. It's not always completely one-sided. People have found healthy leafcutters with the heads of vanquished army ants attached to them, their jaws locked. But in this instance, it's the army ants who are stronger. A massive party sweeps towards and overcomes a leafcutter colony. The army ants pour through the forest in irresistible numbers, and soon the booty is being taken home, the grubs and cocoons of the leafcutters. It's all over very quickly. The hunters have triumphed over the farmers in another round of the continuing fight between the insect worlds Cain and Abel. Massive raids of this kind become a daily event as the army gains recruits. That's to say, as the young grubs grow up and need more and more food. Within a radius of 45 meters of the bivouac, the forest is systematically scoured until virtually everything that crawls has been dismembered and taken back to feed the army. The army ants' three weeks of sedentary life is coming to an end. 
the demand for food is still as great, but the supply is dwindling. It'll soon be time to move on. The outward sign of the change is an increase in the spring cleaning. All the time the bivouac is in use, refuse has been discarded. Indigestible pieces of insects are carried out and dumped into a midden below the tree. As the time comes to move, the midden fills up with the discarded cocoons of the new workers. The midden provides sustenance for enormous numbers of tiny beetles. They're called staphylinids, and in one way they're rather like ants themselves. As a family, they're highly adaptable, producing specialists to live in almost every habitat. Staphylinids like refuse, animal droppings, and decaying matter of all kinds. The army ant's midden is ideal for them. Dung in the midden is collected by a miniature dung beetle, a tiny scarab which lays its eggs in neatly rolled balls of dung. Scarabs were venerated by the ancient Egyptians who thought they looked after the souls of the dead because of their habit of burying the dung balls in a chamber deep underground. The male and female work together to roll up their offspring's food supply. The army ant's whole way of life changes abruptly when the queen stops laying eggs. Soon after dusk, all the ants march out of their temporary home, moving through the forest in a purposeful stream, perhaps as much as 90 meters long. The advance guard lays a scent trail for the rest to follow. The ants will travel a few hundred meters until about midnight, and then set up a temporary bivouac for the rest of that night. A few late developing pupae are carried along by the rear guard. They'll hatch in a day or two on the march. Among the last party to leave the old nest is the queen herself. Her abdomen has returned to its normal size in preparation for a fortnight's nomadic existence, marching and camping by night and hunting during the day. Neither species of ant can be said to be more efficient than the other. They're equally successful in their different behavior. In their encounters with each other, the odds would seem to be even. Like the homeless hunter Cain or the sedentary farmer Abel, the army ants and the leaf cutters show two contrasting ways of exploiting the myriad of opportunities in Trinidad's forests. No wildlife tomorrow night, but on Thursday at 7.30, shiver along with the work of the British Antarctic Survey Team in Pole Stars. <laughs>